Hello students, Ms. Swanson here, and today we're going to learn how to predict the products of single displacement reactions. Now if you haven't yet watched the video on single displacement reactions, please watch that video first and then come back to this one afterwards. I'll put a link in the description box below for the single displacement reactions video. So we have two uh, learning goals for today. The first is to predict the products of single displacement reactions using the activity series. And the second is to predict the products of single displacement reactions using the halogen activity series. So first of all, just a review about single displacement reactions. It's when one element replaces a chemically similar element that's in a compound to produce a new compound and a new element by itself. And when we say chemically similar, that would mean, for example, a metal replacing another metal or a non-metal replacing another non-metal, but a metal cannot replace a non-metal, for example. And so in the picture there, it shows the two main different types of uh, single displacement reactions that we look at, where we have, um, uh, looks like the first one we've got a metal displacing another metal and then the bottom one a non-metal displacing another non-metal. So with the types of single displacement reactions that we'll look at, the first one is when a metal displaces another metal in an ionic compound. The next is when a metal displaces hydrogen from acid or water. In this case, we're treating hydrogen sort of like a metal, even though we know hydrogen has its own characteristics. A metal can displace hydrogen in certain situations. And a non-metal, the third one, a non-metal displaces another non-metal in an ionic compound. So let's start off with a classic example here. When you have a copper wire in a solution of silver nitrate. So the silver nitrate is aqueous, which means there are silver and nitrate ions floating around in water, and the copper wire is a solid. Now over time, the silver will replace the, or sorry, the copper in the wire will replace the silver in the silver nitrate solution to produce a copper nitrate solution, and silver will be left on its own as a solid. And so you can see in the copper wire, sorry, in the wire below, the copper has actually become like little particles of silver that are going around that wire to make a silver solid precipitate while the copper is coming out of the wire into the solution and you can see the solution actually changes color to indicate that you've made the copper sulfate. So here copper displaces silver in a silver nitrate solution and there's the equation for what's happening so we just went through that. However, if we tried to make a solution of copper nitrate and put a silver wire in there, there would be no reaction. So only certain elements can displace other elements. So in this case, copper can displace silver, but silver cannot displace copper. And it has to do with what we call the reactivity series. So certain elements are more reactive than other elements, and these have been ranked in order, and we can use this series to determine which elements will displace other elements. So this is the reactivity series. And elements can displace elements that are below it on the table. So lithium is way up at the top. Lithium can displace any of those metals that are below it. Uh, gold is at the bottom, which means it cannot displace any of those metals above. And something like iron is in the middle, so it can displace cadmium all the way down to gold, but the elements that are above it, it cannot displace. So for example, if we take a look at aluminum and nickel, Aluminum can displace nickel because nickel is below it, but nickel cannot displace aluminum because aluminum is above. So it can only displace elements below it on the reactivity series. The next example is when a metal displaces hydrogen from acid or water. So highly reactive metals can displace hydrogen from water and from acid. So there's an example where sodium is displacing hydrogen from water. And then medium reactive metals, so they're not as reactive as the highly reactive metals, but they are quite reactive. They can displace hydrogen from acids. And there's an example where magnesium is displacing hydrogen from hydrochloric acid. 
And we use a similar table, like the reactivity series table with the metals to determine where or which elements will displace the hydrogen from acids and which ones will displace it from water and which ones cannot displace hydrogen at all. So the elements up here at the top can all displace uh, hydrogen from water. The next grouping all the way down there, these can all displace hydrogen from acid. And then the ones below, you can see there's hydrogen listed there, everything below it cannot displace hydrogen from either acid or from water. So if we take a look here at example at potassium, it can displace hydrogen from water and acid because those, li those uh, arrows listed there are both um, are crossing the potassium line there. If we look at iron, the from acids arrow uh, is a, where iron is, but the from cold water arrow is above it, which means that iron can displace hydrogen from acid, but not from water. And then if we look at silver, it's below the from acids and the from cold water arrows, which means it cannot displace hydrogen from either acid or water. And then the final type of reaction is when a nonmetal displaces another nonmetal. So a reaction between a diatomic halogen and an ionic compound that contains a halogen as the anion can cause a single displacement reaction. So here we have chlorine and uh, sodium bromide, and the chlorine displaces the bromine to produce sodium chloride and bromine. Uh, if we try it the other way around, if we have diatomic bromine, try to react that with sodium chloride, there will be no reaction. So only certain elements can displace other elements. And just like what we saw with the metals, the non-metals, at least the halogens, have a reactivity series as well that we can use to determine which elements will replace other elements. So here, elements can displace elements below it on the table, just like we saw before. It cannot displace anything above it on the table. So fluorine is up at the top of the table, which means it can displace any of the elements below it. Iodine is at the bottom. It cannot displace any of the other halogens. And something like chlorine is in the middle. It cannot displace fluorine, but it can displace bromine and iodine. So if we take an example of chlorine and iodine, Chlorine can displace iodine because chlorine is above iodine, but iodine cannot displace chlorine because iodine is below chlorine, and it can only displace elements that are below it. So let's see how we would predict single displacement reactions. First of all, we need to identify which elements will be, dis will be involved in the displacement. So metals can displace other metals, non-metals, the halogens can displace other halogens, and sometimes a metal can displace hydrogen in an acid or in water, but we cannot have, for example, a metal displacing a non-metal. Locate the elements on the activity series to determine if a reaction will occur. So you're always looking to see if the element you're looking to displace is lower on the reactivity series. And then predict the products based on the proper formation of, a, of chemical compounds, for example using the zero sum rule or the crossing over rule. So let's take a look at an example here. If we take the products magne or sorry, we take the reactants magnesium and copper 2 chloride, then we want to find where they are in the activity series. So here magnesium is above copper, which means it can displace copper because elements can displace things that are below them. So our magnesium and our copper are going to switch places, and I'm just going to write it down here because I'm running out of space. So we end up with magnesium chloride and copper on its own now. So this is how we would solve a problem like this. And this one's balanced already as it is, so we don't need to do any more work. Let's take another look here uh, with lead and tin for chlorate. So if we look here, tin and lead are right next to each other, but tin comes above lead, which means lead cannot displace tin from a chemical compound, which means here we'll write no reaction because no reaction will occur because lead is not able to displace tin since lead comes below tin on the reactivity series. Let's take a look at another example, calcium and zinc. So here calcium comes above zinc which means calcium is able to displace zinc so we'll end up with calcium 
and the sulfur coming together and that's going to be an aqueous compound and then the zinc will be alone. And this one actually is balanced as well so we don't need to do any more work there. Let's take a look at another type of example. Here we're looking at the displacement of hydrogen in an acid. So we have zinc dis uh, looking to displace hydrogen in uh, sulfuric acid. So if we take a look here, zinc crosses the arrow where it says from acids there, which means that zinc can displace the hydrogen from acids. So that will form zinc sulfate, and zinc sulfate is aqueous and it will form hydrogen gas. And this one here actually is balanced already for us, so we don't need to do any extra work there. Let's take a look at another example like that. Nickel and water. Well, if we look at nickel, it's down here, but the arrow for from water is way up here, which means nickel cannot displace hydrogen from water. So here we can write no reaction, because the column or the row for nickel is too far below the from water arrow. Let's take a look at another example. Here we're looking at potassium displacing hydrogen from water. Potassium is way up here, one of the most reactive metals, and it can displace hydrogen from water because it crosses the from cold water arrow. So here we would end up with potassium hydroxide and this is an aqueous compound and hydrogen gas. And let's take a look here. We've got, uh, this one is not balanced, but if we balance it there, we have two potassium, two potassium. We have four hydrogen, two plus two, four hydrogen, and two oxygen, two oxygen. So this one's all balanced for us now. Let's take a look at another type of example. Here we're looking at the displacement of the halogens. So we have bromine trying to displace fluorine and potassium fluoride. Well, if we take a look here, bromine comes below fluorine, which means it cannot displace it. So there is no reaction that occurs because bromine comes below fluorine. Let's take a look at another example. Here we have chlorine and iodine. Chlorine comes above iodine, which means it can displace iodine and sodium iodide. So we'll end up with sodium chloride, which is an aqueous compound, and iodine. So we would end up with this. And here, let's see, whoops, this should be I2. So we can balance like this. And now we have a balanced equation. Let's take a look at one more example. Oh, that was our last example. So we can see that's how we would solve that type of problem. So let's take a look at another at our learning goals again. Can you predict the products of single displacement reactions using the activity series? And can you predict the products of single displacement reactions using the halogen activity series? If you can do this, fantastic. If not, please rewatch the video. And if you're still having trouble, come ask me in class tomorrow. Alright, that's all for now. Bye-bye.